Dark Souls is renowned for its punishing gameplay and challenging boss fights, but what would happen if I took those already perilous encounters and made them slap me back to the bonfire even faster? The only rules for this run are that I have to beat every boss in Dark Souls, including the DLC, except every time one is slain, every enemy in the game gets 5% faster. The player's speed, however, remains unchanged. For comparison's sake, here is what the Asylum Demon looks like normally, and here is what it looks like after eating a single teaspoon of sugar. Just for fun and a little bit of warm-up, I decided to beat the Asylum Demon on double speed. This was definitely intentional, and not just because I was screwing around with the speed variables before this and forgot to change them back before starting. The fight still felt pretty fair and only took a bit more patience than normal. Afterwards, since I wanted the early game to be a tad less boring, I chose to start at 110% speed instead of 105. For those of you who don't want to do the math, that means that by the time we fight the final boss, every enemy will be moving at 230% of their base speed. Fortunately, Dark Souls affords the player a lot of freedom in which order they eliminate most bosses. Unfortunately, this means the pressure is on my shoulders to route this playthrough in a not dumbass way so as to not back myself into a situation that's completely impossible, or worse yet, very, very difficult. On our way to the Undead Burg, we can already see the effects of even a 10% speed buff. It's hard to spot sometimes, but becomes obvious when backstabbing or reposting since the animations get slightly desynced. 110% speed doesn't change too much about our walk to the Taurus Demon, and that goes for the Taurus Demon itself. The speed buff is negligible, and nobody dies to vanilla Taurus Demon after their first playthrough. Okay, it's still the Taurus Demon at the end of the day. I think I might have died to him on my... Okay, don't watch. Turn away. <laughs> oh, you guys. I accidentally uh, included this... this uh, On accident, uh, concluded this version uh, of this mod that actually makes the Taurus Demon impossible to beat. The crazy. I should turn that off. I'm going to turn that off for this attempt. Oh, sorry, guys. And... Bop. We do end up beating him on the second try, but my rant about accidentally making the game harder ironically ended up containing some truth in a way that surprised me later. I'll reveal what that was in a bit, but for now, let's make a game out of it and see if you can figure out what was wrong just by watching the footage. Approaching the bridge, I was kind of worried that the drake might spray fire too quickly for us to get across, but to my relief he just kinda... sat there. Since we took the Master Key as our starting gift, we're free to go pretty much wherever we want from the start. So we journey around Lordrim picking up useful items and taking out mini-bosses. Most of my game knowledge comes from the one-shot challenge I did back in May, and while I'm not trying to default to the exact route I took then, it happens to be optimal to get as strong as possible before going on a boss-killing rampage anyways. At least this time around we can give Lutrec his just desserts before he betrays us. I'm trying not to hit him. Sure about this? I hope I don't fuck this up. <laughs> I cope with this loss by making Maneater Mildred sing the Blighttown Blues. During the fight, I noticed that Invader Phantoms are also affected by the speed buff, which means that friendly NPC Phantoms are probably sped up too. This made me really want to try summoning some friendlies to help with the bosses, but I never did because people might make fun of me or something, I don't know. So we end up not summoning Maneater Mildred and bring nothing but our shitty little plus 5 starting axe to fight the next boss, Chaos Witch Quelleg. Seeing the pitiful damage we deal made me immediately wish we had a better weapon, but I decided to stick it out anyways because wasting the best years of my life is the only way I can get it up anymore. Which is why for good measure I made sure to die when she had only a tick of health left instead of simply winning. After a couple more failed attempts, we finally max out our woodcutting skill as Quelleg falls. I deliberated for a minute whether to kick Ceaseless into the puddle of orange juice while we're here, and decided we might as well so we don't get stuck in a situation later where he spams his super cool and fair fire blast attack so rapidly that it's impossible to get away from him. Perhaps this should have been saved for later, but I'm sure there won't come a time in this run where I'll wish an enemy were 5-10% to 10 slower. On the way back up from Blighttown, I have plenty of time to reflect on the painfully cliché narrative devices YouTubers default to when trying to foreshadow conflict and also grab the power within pyromancy, I think. Like this video and subscribe if you, much like this Twitch chatter, also eat door while watching my content. Our next pit stop is deep in the catacombs, where my third favorite blacksmith awaits to help us squeeze just a bit more firepower out of our pitiful little hatchet. Tragically, I made a fatal mistake resting at the bonfire here instead of using a homeward bone. This means we now have to walk our ass all the way out of here, which is a bit easier said than done. And the reason for that can be summed up in one word. Fucking...
Bone wheels. I know that was two words, arguably even three, but I was really pissed off. Anyone who has played Dark Souls already knows you can't just walk away from these guys lest your spine pay the ultimate price. And although they're still only 25% faster than usual, increasing the speed of bone wheels by any percentage is like eating a spoonful of thumbtacks garnished with all the hair I lost playing this dog shit video game. So yeah, that cozy little bonfire sit down cost me all of 50 minutes to rectify, and thus, four hours into the playthrough, we are now finally fighting the gargoyles. Now, this early footage was recorded a couple months ago, and back then I was young and foolish and under the influence. Long story short, I may have promised that I would fight the four kings immediately if I died to the gargoyles. And, uh, I mean... I'm nothing if not a man of my word. This may have secretly been a blessing in disguise, because the new Londo Ghost Gauntlet, as agonizing as it was, would have only gotten worse the longer it was delayed. In fact, it was already nigh impossible to just run away and climb the ladder here. We only made it through by clearing out all the ghosts on our second try after popping a transient curse. I don't want to talk about what happened to the first one. Honestly, yeah, old stuff can be scary sometimes. I don't know how it... Oh, you're fucking with me! Ingward already knows what's coming to him. Poor dude hasn't survived a single Dark Souls playthrough of mine. Now with new Lotto Drained, we activate a secret fast travel technique to return to the Firelink Shrine. Since fighting Sif is required to challenge the Four Kings, we make our way to the Dark Root Garden. Since we're in the forest area, I figured there'd be wood, I just didn't expect it to end up in my- I took a little bit of convincing, but we ended up joining the forest hunters. This essentially gives us a hall pass to walk straight to Sif. Speaking of whom, it's not like it was particularly slow before, but this doggo absolutely dug up Artorius' coke stash and is experiencing what they call the zoomies. And look at what happens to my health bar when I make even a single mistake. For this fight, we juice up with power within and employ the advanced high-level tactic of Hitting it till it dies. Oh, I guess I did throw some fireballs too. I'm rolling deep low health right now for the damage. I'm nuts. I'm crazy. Let's fucking go. You know that mistake I mentioned earlier that made the game way harder? Well, here comes the big reveal. I had accidentally applied a 50% damage buff to every enemy when I buffed their move speed. I won't bother explaining the series of decisions that led to that mistake because it'd leave more questions than answers. I just thought it was kind of funny that I was getting my health bar deleted by everything and went, oh wow, Dark Souls sure is harder than I remember. By the way, remind me not to get completely hammered later and fight Manus for 12 hours again. With that issue fixed, we head over to the Dark Root Bays in Hydra since we might as well check him off the list early before he's capable of completely walling us with water projectiles. Since he's not a main boss, the enemies won't speed up when he dies. With the crest of Artorius that Sif dropped, we can now challenge the Four Kings, a task I've somehow deluded myself into thinking we were ready for. However, soon after dropping into the Abyss, I was reminded why some people considered a one-shot of this boss to be such a big deal, and uh, yeah, our current loadout is not good enough. Good thing I only promised that I'd attempt this boss, and not that I'd actually beat it. Which means it's time to pay the gargoyles a visit for a quick rematch. A 10% because it's two bosses? Fuck you. Nope. Look, I'm not going to increase my speed by 10% for Ornstein and Smoke, too. Suddenly it's only one boss when it doesn't benefit me, okay? With both bells rung, it's time to check Sen's fortress off our list. It doesn't seem like the boulders or any other traps move faster here, so the fortress is about as easy to conquer as ever. The fight with the Iron Golem is basically exactly what you'd expect when you hear the words Iron Golem but 35% faster. He's almost a real boss now, but still sucks in all the worst ways. What? Okay, I love this video game. Anor Londo is where the run very dramatically shifts from barely any different to I'm in grand finals at a melee tournament and have never touched a GameCube controller. For example, these tower knights become borderline unkillable and start fucking dash dancing on me. The only issue I had against the Painting Guardians was when one of them strategically yeeted themselves off just to screw with my movement while I was locked onto it. Actually, that one particular Guardian went 2-0 on my ass. This is also my introduction to a new potential issue. With sped up animations, reposts and backstabs seem to cause a glitch when they kill an enemy, trapping them in limbo as their soulless husk stares vacantly for all eternity, yearning for a death that can never come. 
Later, we have to cross the rooftops of Anorlando while two average Link mains play neutral. You'd think we die here a bit more than once, but somehow it wasn't too much harder than normal. That's all about to change with the duo boss battle Ornstein and Smoke. This is the first boss of the run I genuinely struggled with. Don't talk to me about the fact I'm still using my starter hatchet, I liked it because it was fast enough to land a hit without being punished. Speaking of fast, the attacks from these two are relentless, and I learned the hard way that Ornstein can cancel a dash attack animation, do a bunch of other attacks, and then, with no windup, can randomly continue his dash from earlier, no matter how much time has passed, and this can potentially repeat forever. I'm unsure if wave dashing Ornstein has always been a thing, but it was genuinely madness and made even his basic walk cycle unreasonably tense. He's still buffering his charge by the way, look at this. He's gonna do it, he's just gonna snap out of whatever animation he's doing at any second and do it. I'm not paranoid, I'm not paranoid, he's gonna do it! He's literally gonna- oh, What did I say?! What did I say?! He's still gonna do it because he didn't finish the attack, look. Okay, maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I am paranoid now, but no, he did it again. I swear to you He's like that forever. He can do it forever now because he won't finish his charge attack It's fucked up. This is the most fucked up fight I've ever played Not to mention that the sheer aggression and frequency of their attacks made this feel almost as oppressive and unfair as the godskin duo from Elden Ring almost. I also pulled chat on whether or not I should be allowed to summon Solaire for this fight, and they decided they'd rather see me suffer than see a quirked up white phantom busting it down sunlight style. I'm kind of glad they did, because while this fight is brutal, it is possible to get into somewhat of a rhythm fighting them. While I was initially just using Power Within for the damage buff, it also helped us spam roll out of danger thanks to the stamina regen it provides. All it boiled down to was waiting for an opening, getting one or two tiny hits, then rolling away. So it was that after two and a half hours of attempts, I still hadn't made it to the second phase of this fight. The reason I didn't want to do the run back of shame from Anor Londo was because A, I'm stubborn, and B, I knew that beating them with our current build was perfectly manageable and would feel more satisfying than if I had grinded for better gear. Just as I was starting to accept that I might be spending the rest of my life in this room, the Godskin Dragon Slayer falls over, and now all we have to do is deal with a cracked out lightning smoke. I gotta say, even though his attacks weren't individually very threatening, there were some combos that were scarier than others. That combined with how tight the timing was to get off even one one safe attack, and the fear of having to tolerate the first phase all over again led to one of the most tense fights I've had in a Souls game in quite a long time. I'm dead. I'm living. No! I was so far away, it felt like I was so far away. Thankfully, either because I've improved a lot over the hours, or as retribution for the god-awful luck I've endured, it only takes two attempts to beat Ornstein again. Tragically though, it's an exact repeat of what happened last time with that lightning slam attack, and well, I'll just let the footage do the talking. Told him I was living. I'm gonna come, dude. We receive the Lord Vessel, free the spell guy Griggs to buy his ring, then proceed to upgrade the Great Club to plus 14, and defeat the Capper Demon because I enjoy making indefensibly bad decisions. The Great Club, believe it or not, was actually upgraded in preparation for our next fight against the Sanctuary Guardian, because the Hand Axe simply wasn't cutting it anymore. <laughs> To that end, we collect the Broken Pendant from the Duke's archives, and in doing so, get locked out of collecting the Crown of Dusk, which can boost damage by 20%. I knew this would happen because this scenario was something I had to actively avoid in my one-shot run, but I assumed it wouldn't be a big deal this time around, and would soon pay dearly for such gross negligence. Before worrying about any of that, though, the Sanctuary Guardian must die. I decided that we absolutely needed to beat the DLC before the hardest bosses in the game got any faster. You need only look at the Sanctuary Guardian itself to understand why. It was fast before, but now Buddy is yoked out of his mind. With how fast he moves, it'd be reasonable to assume the Great Club is too slow to ever land hits consistently, and while that's partially true, there is still exactly one safe punish window for us, the attack where he uses his wings to propel the wind. Armed with that knowledge, it was only a matter of surviving the onslaught and fishing for that window of opportunity. The fight itself, although ridiculously hard, was also very fun. 
Assuming our health was low enough for the red tier stone damage buff, winning only required two hits, and in contrast to some of the bullshit Elden Ring enemies we've been dealing with, it was refreshing to have a juiced up Bloodborne boss instead. Despite its speed and aggression, most hits could be dodged and I found myself being forced to play close to the boss instead of running and waiting for an opening. I ended up enjoying this fight to such an extent that when I beat it an hour later, I was genuinely a bit melancholic that it was already over. I was close. I win! I've won! That wasn't so bad. I feel like I could fight two more of those guys. I'm sure that everybody watching is curious as to how one could possibly beat Artorius of the Abyss at the zenith of his coke addiction. Of course, I started off trying to cheese him with Fire Tempest using the same method I did for the one-shot challenge, but this obviously would never work. The problem is that at 160% speed, Artorius is simply too fast to allow a full cast of Fire Tempest, which means that, for the first time, I'll have to seriously engage with his moveset and learn the mechanics of his PSYCH! <laughs> You actually fell for it! Anyways, permit me for a moment to rant about this silly little boss that FromSoft put in their video game. It's fast, can kill you in a couple hits, and has a unique attack which is practically guaranteed to hit you if you just so happen to be standing too close when it goes off. Compounding the issue further is that it violates the rules of the game by hitting even through invincibility frames. I'm of course referring to... Melania from Elden Ring. But the fight against Manus was pretty rough too. Over the first several hours of attempts, I felt as though there was a pretty consistent pattern and rhythm to follow, but our damage wasn't quite there. So I swapped out my crystal sounding rod and attuned Great Chaos Fireball as a backup spell in case Darkbeed wouldn't finish the job. Since we were locked out of Dusk's Crown until beating Manus, I opted to take out Gwendolyn and use his slightly inferior helmet instead. But what I didn't realize was that the teensy 5% speed boost would be the straw that fucked the camel's ass. Hmm. Hmm. Guys, I'm thinking there might have been a mistake here. The 5%, I'm feeling it. It really, really matters more than you guys would have possibly expected. The dread I felt wash over me as I saw myself get punished for attacking when it would have been perfectly safe before made me almost consider restarting the run. But I didn't. I kept challenging Manus over and over and over, and before I knew it, 12 hours worth of attempts had passed by. 12 hours? Oh, would you look at that? The bottle's empty. As much as I'd like to say that my efforts bore fruit and weren't a total waste, the truth is that I gave up on this fight. I knew it was possible to win, and yet, I couldn't work up the drive to go back and actually beat it. I had nothing to prove, nothing to learn. It was just a matter of how many more attempts it would take before conditions arbitrarily fell into place. When a boss drains you of motivation to such an extent that it delays the video by a month, that's when you know it's time to throw in the towel. Moving on from that defeat, the plan for this run is still to kill as many bosses as possible. Upon doing a bit more research, I found that leveling dexterity to 45 can accelerate spellcasting animations up to 10% for sorceries and a whopping 27% for pyromancies. Armed with this knowledge, we grind hundreds of thousands of souls, then head back to Manus because if 12 hours of losing were enough to make me quit, you would have never discovered this channel in the first place. The dexterity speedup was substantial in that it permitted us to safely launch attacks that would have otherwise been unsafe, and throwing great Chaos Fireball was no longer a death sentence. Eat shit, idiot! Ha 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 ha! I am the winner! I can't believe that's the cathartic release noise I make when I finally beat this piece of shit. If I had a nickel for every time I fought Manus for over 12 hours, then came back with a slightly revised build and won with the same strat in under 30 minutes, I'd have 10 cents, which isn't a lot in this economy, and I might have to go without food. I forgot what my point was. We're not out of hot water yet though, as we still need to take down Calamite. This fight is arguably much more annoying, as it feels like it's up to Calamite whether we get to even play the game. While projectiles themselves don't travel faster, this attack where he flies up and sprays fire below him is dumb and he cheats and oh my god he is so annoying. Aside from that, the rest of his attacks range from exceptionally hard to straight up unreasonable for a human to react to. And boy do I love having my eardrums blown out by Mark of Calamity for the 20th time. Go fuck yourself. 
I must not have had my head on straight for the first hour of attempts because we weren't even wearing any sorcery boosting headwear like we had for Manus. Upon realizing that, we returned to the Dark Root Basin to collect the Crown of Dusk which had become available again after rescuing Dusk in the past. Lucky her. She gets to live this time. Equipping this and the Tin Crystallization Catalyst we obtained in the unadapted chapter of the manga enables us to nearly kill Calamite with three casts of this insanely broken Dark Bead spell, drastically lowering the amount of time and therefore luck we would need to win. With an optimal build, Calamite is no longer an issue. That was actually astoundingly easy. It's fascinating watching all these clips back and hearing the enthusiasm drain from my voice until winning no longer elicits a positive response. Let this be a lesson to you all. If you isolate your heart from the pain of defeat, you'll never savor the joy of victory. There's not a good way to say this that bodes well for viewer retention after this point, but there are no more difficult encounters left in this run. With Darkbeat in hand, we now hold the keys to world peace. Even Bed of Chaos, whose arms were two times faster than normal, somehow ended up being exactly as hard as before. What I can offer you instead is a segment I call Darkbeat ASMR. Welcome to Darkbeat ASMR, where we make this world darker one spellcast at a time. Grab a cup of cocoa and relax as we take very fast bosses and make them dead even faster. Here we are inside the Abyss about to battle the Four Kings, though they should really call themselves the Two Kings after what happened here. Simply delightful. Here we have the Demon Fire Sage, resident of the Demon Ruins. It tries its best but ends up with a belly full of beads. Now that's what I call a hot mess. Off in the distance we spot a rare demon centipede. Though it may be young, it will soon learn the dangers of sticking its neck out for others. Now that's what I call a hot mess. The Lost Isolith, then by extension, the Bed of Chaos, does not exist. You can rest easy. Dark Souls is a masterpiece, and it always was. You've just been Undead Asylumed. Share this video with your friends to totally Undead Asylum them. The Stray Demon gets Undead Asylumed as well. Wow. As our straits appear dire, Grave Lord Nito leaves himself open to attack, resulting in his demise. Fear not the inevitability of death, for in its embrace, we are all equal. Incredible. Seath the Scaleless grapples with the concept of mortality until the very end, branding us with his curse as he departs from this realm. That was fucked up of him to do that. Priscilla of the Painted World claims our kind is not welcome here. How rude. We escort her to the afterlife. The Dragon of Gape... <laughs> the Dragon of... <laughs> the Dragon of Gape crumples under the might of the Seven Spheres of Darkness. Rest easy, big guy. The Butterfly of Dark Root sings the Moonlight Blues, helpless in the face of our superior magic. At the kiln of the First Flame awaits our final foe, the infamous Gwyn himself. Gwyn fails to land a decisive strike, marking an end to his reign as the Lord of Cinder. Now that's what I call a hot mess. Thank you all for watching. Remember to like and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you next time. Oh, and next time I play this game, I'm duping souls. I'm not grinding that stupid fucking phalanx again.